Hello, and welcome to this Tipping Points Drawing Workshop, Where is the Wild, or A Deep Map for the Future, exploring the environs of the rather marvellous Sturley Community Farm in West Yorkshire. Hello, my name is Melanie Rose. I'm a final year PhD student at the, in the School of Design at the University of Leeds and an artist living in Hampshire and a research assistant for the project Tipping Points. Hello, and I'm um, Judy Tucker and I'm in my study, which is right next to the studio where the photograph is taken from. And I've been working from landscape for more years than I care to remember. And when I'm not in my studio or out walking, I'm senior lecturer at the University of Leeds and co-I on this project. So what we'll be doing this today in this workshop is you will be making a series of drawn responses to the really fantastic set of materials provided, especially for this workshop from the locale of Sturley Farm. The materials were gathered with ideas of how past and present landscapes might inform the future in mind, with a very particular focus on how changing agricultural and aesthetic practices affect our understanding of what we see. What we'd like you to do is to keep in mind Barbara Bender and Margot Weiner's assertion that <coughs> landscapes contain the traces of past activities and people select the stories they tell, the memories and histories they evoke, and the interpretive narratives they weave to further their activities in the present future. The workshop activities will then develop into what might be thought of as a deep map of this specific place. Pearson and Shanks describe deep maps as an invocation to record and represent the grain and pattern of place and landscape through really interesting ju juxtapositions and interpretations of the historical and the contemporary, the political and the poetic, the factual and the fictional, the discursive and the sensual. We're coming back to this a bit later on. But for now, <coughs> we'd invite you to watch Steph Turner's interview um, from your set of materials provided for this. Um, workshop, which will give you a little bit of a background and setting for the whole place. We'll welcome you back when you've done that. So, welcome back. Now, we're going to be doing a drawing exercise, Yorkshire Endangered Species Soundscape. And whilst a, what a view also enables us to see, um, and you can see here, I took a photograph, which we'll see later. I really found a place to echo a conventional picturesque composition, but you can see through it, but it also conceals a wealth of wildlife, much of it hidden and dormant compared with past eras. Um, just because we can't see it, of course, doesn't mean it's not there or it can't be reintroduced. So that's one thing to bear in mind. The second thing to think about is that when orchestras or singers or actors or dancers warm up, if it's that's to get limber up in a way before they start um, performing. We've got a sensory drawing exercise about mark making, which offers this to you. But first we'll look at some artists who've worked in this way, creating visual narratives of birdsong, something that way back Gilbert White was trying to do. The first artist, and there's a link there, and you've got the PowerPoint provided if you're interested in her work, is Lucy Stevens, who made these drawings when she was in an artist residency in northern Sweden, um, which was direct response to birdsong. And what you can see is that she writes, I've created a sort of identification register below to represent the vocals for the birds featured in the sound recordings that she made there. The second artist that we're looking at is actually a composer and performer, but he uses the, the visual to inform his sound works, is David Birchall. And these three are pencil drawings based around listening to birds and the very interesting shapes and the kind of ways placed them on the page also echoes the sound from the back of his flats at Wally Range near Manchester. 
a slightly different approach is Jacob Thompson Bell. And we're really, by the way, I wanted to mention, we're so grateful to all three artists who've given us permission to use their work in this um, workshop. And this is um, more of a kind of uh, urban situation and it's more of a mapping or kind of plan of the kind of sounds he was hearing um, in Somerset House. And this one I particularly like, which is the sounds heard in the fountain courtyard during a rain shower under a plastic umbrella. And the, the kind of noises really are very evocative of those sort of sounds. So that's just to kind of set the scene. And here are some um, examples from a, our live workshop um, of people's responses to this workshop where they had um, almost made like a key or map or repertoire of mark making in response to sounds that you're about to hear. And there's another slightly more sort of freer um, set of works. And just one other thing, which is so relevant to our projects that I wanted to put, draw your attention to is this piece of work, which is a link here to, which is um, images of faint signals on screen by the design and artist group, Invisible Flock. And you can see it's um, there at the British Library and the setting is a fictional Yorkshire forest and shows us how natural sound has evolved over the past 50 years because they were able to access the library's full collection of sounds and that that way they reveal the complexity and diversity of the natural landscape of our county right okay is everyone ready over to you mel okay so what we want you to do is um to use any materials that you've got to hand so pencils fine liners mark pens chalk and we're going to play you 10 sounds lasting 30 seconds each. And we want you to draw what you think the sound sounds like. And you can do, as Judy said, you can do this in any way you want to. You might want to make a key as if making a map and write the name of the animal or the bird or the whatever it could be um, next to the sound. Or you might want to layer them or put them together, arrange them however you like. So Judy, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go here. Here's number one. And sound number two. Sound number four. Number five, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
six. seven Sorry, everyone, that was slightly premature, but sound number eight. And finally, sound number 10. <laughs> So we hope you are now all thoroughly warmed up. Yeah, and here, here's, a, here's the title of all the sounds that you listened to. So number one was a turtle dove, number two, a pine marten, number three, a red squirrel, number four, a greater horseshoe bat, number five, a hedgehog, number six, a merlin, number seven, a beaver, number eight, a barn owl, number nine, a wind chat, and number 10, a dormouse. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and just to kind of summarize what this warming up exercise was all about. So you were drawing and mark making in response to wildlife sounds. We played you the sounds of wildlife that once was there, is now there and that might return. There was a little bit of an emphasis on more endangered species, or those rarely seen, but that are found in Yorkshire. Hopefully you concentrated and listened carefully to each sound individually, then you interpreted this somewhat playfully through drawing and mark making. And in a way, you could think that the individual drawings sit next to each other on the page or in a notebook in a parallel way in which animals, birds and insects coexist in the same landscapes. We hope that the drawings might also operate as a kind of key to a deep map and create a sort of repertoire of marks that might inform some of the later drawing exercises we're going to do. So, on to the next one. And this one is taking a line for a walk, famously, um, as Paul Clay said, or continuous line drawing. So, Mel. Right, so what we're doing is I'm following um, a snowy walk that's on the materials list. And I'm watching the screen and I'm just drawing continuously with my, I think my non-drawing hand actually in this one. Um, I'm using a fine line and I'm just following what the camera's showing me. I'm not looking at the page, I'm just following the screen in front, drawing the shadows, the marks, the structures, the trees, just the 
lines that are, that are being made on the screen. That's great. So just move on to the next slide where something else yes. happens. <laughs> yes, I've complicated things. I've added, I'm now drawing with both my hands, so dipping ink, a twig into ink, and I'm drawing with a marker pen. Um, and again, just following what's in front of me on the screen and trying to draw with both hands, sometimes together, simultaneously, and sometimes separately. Fascinating. Very interesting kind of ways of getting very fluid and kind of unusual marks that you wouldn't necessarily um, plan to. And it makes you really look at the person, you know, the walk that the person is going on. Um, and it's a completely different way. You're totally scrutinizing every sort of piece of information. And it, you know, in a way that one's quite interesting because you can also hear the footsteps. So sound yeah. comes into play as much as viewing. So we've just got a couple of examples um, of responses that people made in our live workshops. Here's one you can see very much probably using the two handed approach, I would say. Yeah. And another one which has got a sort of slightly different resonance here with kind of different marks and so on. So. Fantastic. So now, if you go into your materials, you'll find a video labelled Snowy Walk. Um, we invite you to go off and find that and to um, make your continuous line drawing from that place, bearing in mind everything that Mel and I have told you. And we'll, so we'll see you in about 10 or 15 minutes. Hello and welcome back. And what we're going to be doing another um, sort of walk drawing, but this time with some slightly different things in mind. Um, going to introduce the concept of deep mapping and also the idea of landscape as palimpsest and a sort of and rhythms and bodies. It's a slightly different approach. So, what is deep mapping? Kind of referred to it in the introduction, and it reflects. Um, an 18th century antiquarian approaches to place, which weren't perhaps quite as objective in inverted commas as some of the days ones today and so it could also include the maps might include history folklore importantly for this workshop natural history and hearsay and the deep map attempts to record and represent as we said before the grain and pattern of place through putting together juxtapositions and interpenetrations of the historical and the contemporary, what was then and now, the political and the poetic, the discursive and the sensual, the conflation of oral testimony, anthology, memoir, biography, natural history, and everything you might ever want to say about a place. Now, obviously, we're just touching on that, but it's just a way of thinking that's taking us beyond the scene. Um, here's just a photograph of some of my sketchbooks that I make when I'm actually out on site. I draw, I walk. I stop, I listen, I think, and I maybe also use archival material as I'm going. And here, Ian Biggs, the artist, um, friend and colleague of ours, has very kindly allowed us to use some of his work in this presentation. Um, he's very much a proponent of deep mapping in this project, which is on the borderlands between England and Scotland. And you can see here, this is some of his research materials. He's got photographs, he's got maps, he's got some archival things. You can see the second one from the right, Barnes Plantation Earthworks. And then he, in the second one in from the left, he sort of overlapped them with his own imagery. So it's about layering and the idea of a palimpsest, which as we know is about layers of traces that we can see underneath coming through from the past into the present. And um, here's some of his constructions which demonstrate these sort of aspects of deep mapping, in particular, looking at the one on the left with the photographs at the bottom with draw botanical drawings overlaid and those, and different kinds of motifs. So sometimes we're looking flat on at a place, sometimes we're looking overhead, sometimes we're looking as if we're drawing in the landscape itself. And so that's one thing to bear in mind is the sort of idea of that you can kind of track the past of a place through 
the traces left in the landscape. The other idea is something that the artist, again, very kind, we're so grateful to everybody for letting us use their work in this. Rebecca Thomas, who uses this idea where she's, um, she actually, not like I stop when I draw, but she walks, draws and walks at the same time. So you've got this idea of the layers of marks and the body kind of in the rhythms of the, a body walking through space. There's sort of much choppier, smaller marks than the kind of examples you saw in Mel's demonstration videos. And here's another example of her work, this time it's a print, where you've got layers of these sort of rhythms building up here. So, and these are some examples from previous um, live workshops. You can see this one mapping the undergrowth palimpsest sort of very vigorous marks, but also we're inviting you to think a little bit about who might be living in there. Some of that, maybe some of those creatures you heard might be in there. Maybe you can make sounds that represent or consider those. And here's another one with a slightly more delicate version of the same um, exercise. So this drawing exercise is focused on layering palimpsest and walking rhythms and invites questions about who and what might be living in the grasses, trees, walls and hedgerows. And I particularly like this one because you've got the repetitive marks which almost look like footsteps. For this one, um, please now go to the landfill site um, video and use that to trigger a set of drawings that respond to what I've just said and then we'll welcome you back when you've done that. It's about a 10 minute, 15 minute video. So welcome back and this is a very different kind of drawing but we hope now that you've loosened up you'll be able to kind of slow down and tighten up and maybe make some slightly more slower drawings. Yes, so basically what we want you to do, as Judy said, is to slow right down now um, and to take your time. Um, and this um, exercise is about thinking about animals or species that might be come out at night, that might live under this in the soil, might live in the water, the species that we don't see very often or take much notice of, but are non nonetheless still there. So um, what we'd like to do is to consider drawing um, zoology, zoological or botanical um, images, um, which have been used historically, whether they've been taking the outside in, whether they've been used for fabrics and curtains, but we want you to make a connection between what is out there um, and sort of remi remind ourselves by drawing and or particularly drawing these species. Oh, and here's some um, design examples made by you, I think, Mel. Yes, yeah, we went to the British Library and looked at Curtis's Botanical. Um, and as you say, some of those plants, these are quite exotic plants, but actually there's right, real beauty in dandelions, in what we consider as weeds, but just plants in the wrong place, or spiders, beetles, you know, frogs, toads, they're all just wondrous and just wonderful to draw. And this, <laughs> it's this idea of slowing down and focusing and thinking about um, how to do that in a slightly more design aspect. So it, with this in mind, one of our recent art and design students from the University of Leeds, who's now um, a professional designer, um, Katie Bennett Rice, who's an illustrator. This is her degree show work. And you can see here, she's done these very detailed drawings of, in fact, these particular ones are with seashores, but the kind of mark making and things she's considering are absolutely relevant for this um, project. You can see here a little fish poking its nose out of a sort of rocky um, seaweedy place. And you can see very much, she's also considered um, what might be endangered and what might be changing. And this was made after she left um, the university, but probably more relevant for this. But even though these are quite careful drawings, I hope you can all see that the mark making exercise that you've done now really resonate even in this sort of detailed drawing and here's a little one of a detail from her hedgerow piece and just to kind of emphasize that, that there's also this idea of the kind of crossover between art and design but how might we challenge our views of what is valued well um, the design group Timorous Beasties have done that 
quite often in terms of putting in maybe things that we might consider as weeds or unusual species and kind of different, slightly subversive plant formations into their wallpaper designs. And that's in a way, all of this can help um, reinterpret and reconsider what we value and why. So what we want you to do is to select um, a species that you particularly like to draw um, and have a really good look at, at the species before you start drawing it. Um, and then to draw an outline first in pencil. Um, sometimes it helps to draw the shape first, just the outline of the shape. And to, to check that you've drawn it symmetrically, a good idea is to either um, turn it upside down or to look at it um, reflected in a mirror or even to take a photograph of it with your phone and just to distance yourself slightly and have a look. Is it symmetrical? Do you need to redraw it? Once you're happy with your drawing, um, to go over it with um, fine liner or pen and ink or even a black biro, um, you can get some fantastic um, results from. Vary the tones, so make the darks really dark um, and use mark making to accomplish texture, particularly on sort of the beetles or toads or even in the oak galls that I've used here, just like this very subtle texture, but it really does make a difference. Um, yeah, and you might need to t have a couple of attempts. Certainly I had to draw the beetle twice because I drew it too big to start with uh, before I felt I was happy with him. That's great. And just yeah, these drawings are made by Mel, I'm using, as you can see here, um, um, oak gall ink. And so it's quite an interesting thing where she's got the relationship between the materials she's used and what she's drawn. That's just something to bear in mind for, fu for future. You can actually use um, natural materials to make drawing and painting implements because of course that's where pigments come from. We've got a few examples of um, some of the work that people did from this in our previous live projects and we particularly wanted to put in um, this one because we think about um, the farm and the pigs and the animals that might once have been there and still are there. It's really charming drawing here and some very careful drawings of a merlin mm. and then drawing a plant and an amphibian. So just to give you some ideas of what people you might get might get up to. And we've shared in the materials, you've got a link in the PDF, so you can either click on that link or, as we've said before, if you've got your own wildlife books or your own photographs, we really encourage you to use these two. There's no rush with this one. This may well take you an hour at least or more, but you can do this quietly and think about, um, take your time, relax and draw. Here, this is just to give you some of the ideas of what you might do. And we'll welcome you back. Perhaps you'll need to break off this um, for our final exercise. Hi, welcome back. So we've had already quite a rich morning or session. And why do we like certain landscapes? And how might a new approach to landscape change our views? Now that's a little bit of a pun because it's views that we see out there, but also perhaps the way we think about landscape itself. So I put together a kind of mini art history of um, Castle Hill and um, found some examples of it without its castle. And so on the word picturesque refers to an ideal kind of landscape that has an artistic appeal in that it's beautiful, but also with some elements of wildness. So you'll see at the beginning, I put in the photograph where I got a tree to one side. So that idea of the cultivated and um, man-made coming together in one. And Claude Lorraine set the precedent, which when William Gilpin, the Englishman, formulated into a set of rules which people used um, in the 18th century, not only about how to draw and paint a landscape, but how to look at one. Way, so this way of thinking about landscape was very much inspired by European artists whose paintings were collected by the wealthy on the grand tours in the past. And those artists evoked the classical authors, transforming the landscape into an idyllic and harmonious, harmonious pastoral. And this is in a way we all unconsciously carry these images of landscape in our heads and we kind of expect to see it when we're out there. So what might we need to do to kind of alter that? And 
in a way, um, this is like a precursor to your mobile phone. Um, Claude Lorraine often used a tinted mirror to determine his compositions. And um, you could imagine you'd hold this, this is a Claude glass, which you'd hold with your back to the landscape and you'd look into it and you'd see it reflected in and kind of almost like as if it was a composition taken on a mobile, a precursor to a mobile phone, as I said. So here we've got some images of landscapes very close to Castle Hill, which are very much, uh, they've got a vignette. They're somewhere between the picturesque and the romantic. They're clearly after the enclosures, we can see the um, stone walls have come in, and it, but in the distance, we've got um, the sort of wild moorland. And, um, the idea of picturesque also has very much this background, middle ground and foreground. And this, these are shown in these very much through the weight of Mark, slightly darker as they come nearer. And here is an image of um, view of Huddersfield could even perhaps have been from Castle Hill itself. And we would like to thank Brad Scanlon and Kirk Lee's Museums and Huddersfield Art Gallery for allowing us to use these images in this talk. And you can see here in the foreground, very much the agricultural um, scene with cows and some happy looking farm workers. And this echoes an er the earlier picturesque where you would have a scene in the foreground, the middle ground, which is often in the kind of conventional picturesque, if you like, often was a um, a classical um, temple or something. Here we've got Huddersfield with its smoking mill chimneys and in the distance, the moors. And um, Lockwood Viaduct from close by, um, where we again, the idea of the co farm cottages and the mill workers cottages in the foreground, the rather marvelous viaduct striding across the landscape, fading off into the distant hills here, all very close by, and Castle Hill itself from the mid-century, um, with the path leading through up into um, the right-hand side of the paints, leading your eye in and up to the castle itself, the folly that was built to commemorate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. So, that just gives us a little bit of a sense of the kind of aesthetics that we might carry with us. So Alexandra Harris in the, her article, Nature Writing and Landscape Art writes, um, we are in the midst of a new era of place perception in Britain. Questions of what landscapes mean to us, who sees them and what they are for, are all being debated now with an intensity perhaps unmatched since the first age of domestic tourism, where some of those images that I've shown you might have been made, um, landscape painting, aesthetic philosophy in the late 18th century. So what she argues is that work on the history of landscape art has a very influential role to play today, more so than ever. And she invites us, and we invite you, to join in this conversation about the place of art and the history of art in national understandings of landscape now. And we've got some photographs from our special materials from Sterling Farm and some which um, really focus in on something that might almost be a subversion of our expected understanding of the picturesque here. And we're just bringing in the idea of rewilding and the one that's known extremely well is the Nep Castle. Many of you will probably have heard of it. Um, and Alexander Harris writes, the owners of the Nep Castle estate in West Sussex have been conducting a radical experiment in rewilding for the last 15 years. And as you'll know from listening to the interview, um, and you may listen to the others that we provided, parts of um, Sturley Farm are being very much given over to encouraging regrowth of native species, not a full rewilding as such, but areas like the um, coppice and so on are being grown to encourage sort of a diversity. In a grippingly argued book on the rationale for the project, Isabella Tree records the heartfelt objections of local people who hated the look of the pig root of mud. And by the way, that's why um, the participant drew the pig was because she felt she really liked that idea of the relation between farm animals and pig root of mud and the scrubbing creating where previously there'd been a fine park laid out by Repton. She writes, I used to walk there myself and I sympathise. 
Isabella Tree asks quite rightly how it is that an artificially designed and unproductive environment should see more beautiful than one in which natural processes are thriving. So this is what we're inviting you to think about. Um, through, the, although that she writes the debate about what is natural and what is wild, as we can see in Surly Farm, is very complex and perhaps unresolvable. And just one more idea to throw in before we set you off with these um, thoughts is that David Matlas writes um, um, that the geographer Stephen Tooth in his online glossary for the Anthropocene defines the Anthropocenic and the SC is very important because that means we're talking about an aesthetic, not the geological era. Um, as referring to landscapes that have come to be viewed as picturesque, i.e. scenic, but that are actually in a far from natural, highly altered state. And he gives the example of the Elan um, Valley of Mid Wales, and I've included um, Ramsden Reservoir as a kind of um, similar um, landscape, which is only a few miles from Castle Hill, which is something that we view this as scenic, but really, of course, a reservoir, the plant, the conifer plantations, the grouse moors above, every single aspect of this landscape is far, far from natural. So let's think about how we might subvert, work with and against the ideas of the picturesque. So we've perhaps we've begun to answer, just begun to answer why we might like certain kinds of landscapes. And perhaps we've perhaps begun to just interrogate slightly how a new approach to landscape might change our views. So in terms of the drawing exercise, which relates to this, there's a whole raft of materials, photographs, including the 360 degree ones um, provided in the materials. Choose four contrasting photographs from those provided and make small compositional sketches in your notebooks. Think about ideas of the picturesque and ideas of what we expect to see in a beautiful landscape. Then think how you can both work with and subvert these in the light of rewilding. I think you might think about mark making because that's been the theme of the day. And also you might want to use the vignette and fader image away into the page. After you've thought, considered it, select your most successful sketch to make a more resolved drawing. Here are four sketches from the, the live workshop where you can see the very um, succinct way that the marks have been made to kind of understand the composition and to think about which one might be interesting to work up. And here another set, really diagrammatic, which is great above. You don't have to do a very detailed drawing for this, it's just to understand what to do. And then a slightly larger one. And you can see this um, participant has decided to think a little bit about the vignette in this. This is a more conventional but very um, skillful um, landscape, um, landscape drawing made at a, at a longer period than just simply the um, workshop, working out the, those ideas. So we've got the stone wall, the scrub, and then Castle Hill behind. This is a study from one of the photographs, and this was um, worked up in as a final more kind of resolved piece into this piece incorporating collage watercolor and pencil marks very effective very much the idea of the natural and a very different kind of close-up rather than the long view here a, a, a piece which is incorporating different aspects from different photographs into one painting looking very much like a near romantic piece and a very different piece of work, again, but made after the workshop in response to what we've set, but the idea of a patchwork of close-ups and of looking closely and deeply and this very much going towards the design idea. Again, a composition done on dark paper. You might, if you happen to have any dark paper, you might like that idea of reversing out, almost like a lino print or study for a lino print. And this one is final piece, which very much responds to the idea of a deep map of the idea of thinking about 
palimpsest, place, rewilding through textile and stitch came, came out of the workshop. Just looking at the um, washing machines and bed springs and all sorts in there, Judy. Yes, exactly. So this idea of the landfill, this was from that walk that you, some of you will have done, um, the idea of growing up out of what was under the landfill here. And this one of a Merlin, you get the textures representing different aspects of the landscape it sits on. And I couldn't finish any um, sort of mini art history of Castle Hill without including my colleague and friend's work, Deborah Gardner, Yorkshire Monument. And this is really very interesting because it works again with and against the picturesque in a sculptural form using found objects, using the idea of Arta Provera. But you can see a cardboard model of the hill and then underneath all this, these textiles and lumps of coal which were collected from the area representing um, the industries that once would have been there and that maybe have formed this landscape. So if you are interested in pursuing the, any of these ideas, there's, you've seen examples from our live workshops of how to develop this into more finished or resolved pieces of work, but we've made a few suggestions here that might um, inspire you.